Yeah, welcome back to the conversation in New Central Television. Now, moving on to Zimbabwe, where President Emerson Ngagwa secured a second and final term in office, a victory contested by the opposition and questioned by observers. Despite the nation's ongoing economic turmoil, Nangagwa, who assumed power after the 2017 military coup that ousted long-term President Robert Mugabe, was widely predicted to win due to the election's skewed conditions favoring the ruling ZANU-PF party. Official results from the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission showed Nangagwa with 52.6% of the vote while his main rival of the Citizens' Coalition for Change, Triple C Party, Nelson Chamisa, received 44%. The opposition rejected the outcome, citing irregularities and accusations of voter suppression, with plans to challenge the results in court. Now, joining me live from Zimbabwe to discuss uh, the elections is Kuda Kwashe Munemo, advocacy coordinator IYWD. We also have Linda Sungarirai Maserira, a presidential uh, aspirant. A warm welcome to you, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for joining me on the conversation. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting us. Now, I'd like to start with you, uh, Linda. What's your overall assessment of the just concluded general elections in Zimbabwe and the announcement of the results? Uh, did they meet international standards to you? Uh, were they free and fair? What's your uh, assessment? My assessment was that um, people went out and voted. Yes, there were irregularities, especially on the day that uh, people actually voted, especially in Arare, Blawai, and Manikaland, where the ballot was late. But I believe that the process was smooth. There was no violence and a few number of intimidation were recorded. But at the end of the day, I believe that everyone who was sincere about casting their vote actually cast their vote. And um, I know there might be a lot of reservations from different spaces, but we also have to consider the political landscape in Zimbabwe, where we've got 70% of the population resident in, Zimbabwe, in, in rural areas, and 70% of the electorate as well being resident in the rural areas, which always gives ZANU-PF, the current ruling party, more advantage over any other opposition political party. So when, even when we look at the results themselves, they are in some areas like Marshall and Central where even no opposition managed to get a seat. And when we try to tally even the number of um, parliamentary seats that opposition got and zanu have got, it shows that ZANU maintained its stronghold and Triple C got votes in its own stronghold. So at the end of the day, we might say a lot, but I believe that if everyone maintained their strongholds, the, the, the elections uh, are actually a result of what people have voted for, not what people think should have had voted for. Yes, the process was not free. The f process was not fair from the, from the, um, from the pre-election period where the delimitation report itself was flawed. I think that was the starting point of the flaw from Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Your uh, position is that, you know, at the end of the day, the, uh, it balances itself out because uh, the ruling party got votes uh, in its stronghold and the opposition uh, did in its uh, stronghold, even though the entire process might not be perfect. Now, let me bring Kuda Kwashe into the conversation. Uh, Kuda Kwashe, it's quite striking that the opposition is rejecting the election outcome. And international observers have also raised concerns uh, about the conduct of the just concluded elections. How does this situation reflect on the current uh, state of Zimbabwe's electoral process? Uh, thank you so much. I must say that from the beginning itself, during the pre-election period, there were a number of concerns which were raised by local are rich now as well as global observers regarding the elections and quite a number of issues were identified which actually puts a dent on the elections are being free fair and credible as well you would speak of the overt and also covert violence and intimidation which was witnessed especially in rural communities 
but you'd also speak about the delay in the release of the voters' role itself. These are some of the issues that were raised by observers, including ourselves as we're observing on the ground. And on the actual day, despite assurance by the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission that there were more than 98% ready to conduct the elections, you would then realize that in some communities, the ballot papers were actually being printed for delivery on the same day, which resulted in, in a number of prospective voters having to wait for many hours before they cast their votes. And in some communities, you also, for example, in Mashingo, you would realize that a candidate in the local authority elections had their details missing from the voters, uh, from, from the ballot paper itself. So there were quite a number of issues which do put a dent on the credibility of the elections. Uh, we are joined by Linda Masarira today. She was a prospective candidate for the presidential elections, but because of the exorbitant nomination fees, mm -hmm. she was not able to be considered by the electorate themselves. So you would actually say that from the onset, as we're approaching the elections, they were already not in a, an environment which is free, fair, and credible. Thank you, Kudukwashe. I'd like to bring in our third uh, guest into the conversation, Dr. Urayayi Zembe, the president of the Democratic Party uh, of Zimbabwe. Dr. Zembe, oh, it's a pleasure having you join us. Thank you. I can hardly hear you. Uh, Dr. Zembe, digging deeper into the reports of irregularities uh, during the just concluded elections, could you help us understand the specific instances or methods that might have contributed uh, to these concerns. And it's as a result of these concerns that the opposition has rejected the results. And how might these uh, incidences of corruption uh, and uh, this climate of fear uh, affect the overall legitimacy of the election results? Gibenga, can you hear my... Can you hear me? I can hardly hear you. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, Dr. Zembe. Yeah, there is uh, interference. The line is not clear to me. However, let me shoot in the dark. Um, yes, the you know current uh, electoral chaos or anarchy in the country was caused by a dysfunctional constitution of Zimbabwe amendment number 20 of 2018, which was uh, enacted by Robert Gabriel Mugabe, the former state president of Zimbabwe. He crafted a document according to his mm. own wishes. Now we are... Ten years later, we are faced with uh, a constitutional crisis where the incumbent president, who is a candidate in the current election, presided over the electoral mess. Uh, a day ago, there's a video making rounds in the social media where the chairperson of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission Madam Justice Chigumba is confessing that uh, ZEC is not independent. She's actually calling on Parliament to give her the powers. In other words, the ZEC, the independent power to preside and manage an election in Zimbabwe. So that is the source of the current electoral anarchy, chaos, and disorder. So as a result, we have seen the full play out of the dysfunctionality of this constitutional order, which now belongs to Mr. Uh, Munangagwa. So he was now resisting the people's power through an election. He is now resisting uh, being removed from office by Zimbabweans. This is why now it has become clear that all the observer missions, genuine ones, who are the majority have made, uh, have qualified the elections as unfree, unfair, and uncredible. We have a major player who has now declared 
that the result was a bogus result, largely the presidential vote, and that uh, he has rejected both the electoral process and the results. So we wait to see the recourse that Advocate Nelson Chamisa will embark according to the 2013 Constitution. Section 93 lays out uh, the, the, that uh, any candidate who has a, a, a grievance is free to approach the Constitutional Court within seven days from the date of the announcement of the sham result, the presidential result. So we expect to see the constitutional petition by Advocate Nelson Chamisa. And after the Constitution, the Constitutional Court had received the petition, it must hear the matter within 14 days from the receipt of the application. Which means if we go by the deadlines, we can only know of the Constitutional Court's decision after hearing the petition on or before the 16th of September in 2023. So okay. I stop here for a moment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zembe. Uh, and to summarize Dr. Zembe's thoughts, he uh, follows the line of the majority of uh, observers that has said the conduct of the just concluded elections was nothing uh, short of free and fair. There were widespread irregularities. He also says uh, he believes uh, the main opposition candidate, uh, Nelson Chamisa, is going to seek uh, constitutional ways uh, to address uh, this problem and uh, to address uh, the election results and contest it. Uh, now back to you, Linda Masirira. ZANU-PF's continued dominance uh, of Zimbabwe politics over the years is quite intriguing. Uh, given the economic challenges and accusations of authoritarianism. How have they managed to remain in power? What specific aspects of the political system have allowed them to maintain this stronghold uh, despite these issues they've faced uh, over the years? Um, first and foremost, sorry, before I go to your question, I just wanted to correct Dr. Zembe. The constitution of Zimbabwe was not created by Robert Mugabe himself. It was the opposition and the ruling party that formed COPAC, which was an institution that was responsible for formulation of that constitution. That constitution went to a referendum and Zimbabweans voted for it. I think that sometimes when we come on international platforms, which is, we should also desist from spreading falsehoods. It is important to note that the constitution of Zimbabwe was actually the voice of the people of Zimbabwe through consultations and was enacted in 2018. And then going forward, zanu PF has managed to maintain its stronghold in rural areas. They can relate to the issues affecting people in rural areas. I've said it before to my colleagues in opposition, that as long as we do not relate with the situation and the problems that the rural electorate face, we will find it difficult to be able that, that to... Beyond, to Linda, beyond area. relating with Opposition these problems, has ZANU-PF been able to address some of these problems of uh, the rural folk in Zimbabwe, not just relating uh, to them? Uh, exactly. That's what I'm explaining. ZANU-PF continues to enjoy its majority in rural areas. We can never take that away from them. We are all falling short, myself included, when it comes to penetration in rural areas because we do not yet understand how to deal with the electorate in rural areas. That is why ZANU-PF continues to enjoy massive support predominantly from the rural areas where we've got the majority of the Zimbabwean citizens. And as long as we do not want to face the truth as opposition, we will remain opposition until the cocks come to roost. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda. It's important to note that it wasn't just uh, presidential elections uh, that took place uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, there was also uh, parliamentary elections. Now, Kudu Kwashi, uh, ZANU-PF's victory in the parliamentary race uh, certainly holds uh, some level of significance. Very important uh, victory. Now, could you explore how ZANU-PF's majority in parliament might help 
uh, reshape the legislative landscape of Zimbabwe and the functioning of the government in the near future, as uh, President Emerson Ngagwa uh, is believed to begin his second term, uh, barring anything the Constitutional Court uh, says if his elections are challenged by Nelson Chamisa. Uh, thank you so much. As it stands now, it is quite clear that no single party is two-thirds of the members of parliament, which is quite progressive on the part of the voter, on the part of the electorate, in the sense that there cannot be any party which may utilize a two-thirds majority to bring about its preferred policies, its preferred laws, and most importantly, adjustment to the country's uh, constitution as it stands. So as it is now, it is quite clear that they will be able to use their simple majority to at least approve some of the crucial documents, such as the budgets, which is part of the policy making as well. But also without an absolute two-thirds uh, majority, it is clear that we might not witness some of the rushed bills or some of the rushed pieces of legislation which may at the end of the day affect the citizens. Some years back, there was talk by some of the ZANU-PF aligned young people who were calling for a, the possibility of a third term, that is by adjusting or amending the country's constitution, which currently provides for a maximum of two terms per leader, which in this case means that President Mnangagwa, if he is to remain the president after fought. the announcement of the results, this is likely to be his final term. So hopefully we won't then have abuse of majority to amend the country's constitution in a manner that is retrogressive. I mean, even if it's uh, just, but now it, it, it will the have to. Opposition it, is to take. It will be 85 at the next elections in Zimbabwe, and I don't think it will have the strength uh, to go on. But uh, you look at Robert Mugabe and say, why not? Uh, finally, as we wrap up conversation, I'd like to bring back uh, Dr. Wurayai Zembe into the conversation. Now, Dr. Zembe, looking ahead, what diplomatic and domestic hurdles uh, do you think President Emerson and Gagwa's administration uh, might face due to the contested election outcome? And how might these challenges steer Zimbabwe's trajectory in the years to come, both internally and in terms of international relations? Hello, Dr. Zembe, are you there? Yeah, I can hardly hear you, Gibenga. But I think I have the gist of what you were saying. The position is that uh, because of the electoral anarchy and the chaos we are currently uh, in, the, there is a stalemate here. Zimbabweans are deep in a, an electoral constitutional crisis. Things aren't moving at all. So the international community, following the local and regional communities, rejected the current electoral process and the results is a big sham it's all a bogus affair. Zimbabweans have been prevented from appointing a government through peaceful civilian elections by the current ruling ZANU-PF party and its government. They have the powers that are dysfunctional, as I indicated earlier on. So we have a big obstacle which has disrupted the people's job to elect a legitimate government through free and fair elections. Now, this election and its results should be scrapped, scrapped off, which means Zimbabweans must sit around a table and begin to debate the way forward. And this can be done under the tutelage of the United Nations, the African Union, and the Southern. Luckily, Zimbabwe is a member of the, these uh, bodies. 
And uh, we expect to see the membership uh, rights being exercised to help Zimbabweans to undertake a process to appoint the government legitimately, okay. uh, uh, peacefully, yes. and democratically. There's no way out for me, I can see here, because we need a legitimate government in Zimbabwe as we speak right Th now. We can't go for five years with uh, an illegitimate uh, administration and uh, with a very chaotic, dysfunctional system of government. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Zembe. I'm afraid uh, we're out of time. I'd like to say a big thank you to our distinguished guest, uh, Kudakwashe Munemo, Advocacy Coordinator, IYWD, joining us from uh, the Zimbabwean capital, Harare, and also Dr. Gurayai Zambi, uh, the Democratic Party president, and also Linda Tsungirai Masarira, presidential aspirant of the lead uh, party. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, you all, thanks for your time, your insights, and your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really a problem. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You're and this is where we draw the curtains in today's edition of the conversation. In the first half, we did look at the situation in Nigeria, where the Social and Economic Rights Accountability Project, Sarah, has given the president 48 hours to reverse his decision to ban 25 journalists and media houses. Uh, from coverage of the presidential villa and we just concluded our conversation on the just concluded elections in zimbabwe where president emerson nangagwa has been voted according to results from the zimbabwe electoral commission for second term in office thank you for being a part of the program see you next time i am benga aboroa <laughs>